This video discusses several key definitions of giftedness, which will help inform your understanding and practice with regard to giftedness in the classroom. Francis Galton is regarded as the father of giftedness. Galton's book, Hereditary Genius, published in 1869, was an attempt by him to find the underlying reasons for what he called eminence. In explaining the title of his book, he stated he was describing an ability that was exceptionally high and at the same time inborn. One of the most enduring aspects of Galton's work is the use of the word gifted to refer to people who have achieved eminence in their particular field. He used the word talent as a synonym for gifts. In the 1920s, Lewis Terman drew on the work of Alfred Binet and developed the Stanford Binet IQ test. He conducted a longitudinal study of gifted individuals which lasted over 40 years. Terman used an IQ of 140 as a cut-off point for his subjects, who later became known as Terman's termites. The Cold War encouraged an expansion in gifted education in the United States. In 1972, a congressional report called the Marlin Report stated that gifted and talented children are those identified by professionally qualified persons who by virtue of outstanding abilities are capable of high performance. These are children who require differentiated educational programs and or services beyond those normally provided in regular school programs in order to realise their contribution to self and society. The Marland Report listed six specific abilities in which children can be gifted. These are general intellectual ability, specific academic aptitude, creative or productive thinking, leadership ability, visual and performing arts, and psychomotor ability. It's worth noting that the final ability, psychomotor ability, was dropped from the definition because it was felt that this had already been well catered to in school. There's a very clear issue here. Schools traditionally are quicker to credit achievements in sport and performing arts compared to academic pursuits. The Marland Report also recognised teachers as professionally qualified to identify gifted children. In an Irish context, this raises several questions. In particular, how can teachers identify gifted children when there is no formal training at initial teacher education level in Ireland in the field of giftedness? In 1991, a group of gifted education researchers met up in Columbus, Ohio to discuss existing definitions of giftedness. The aim of the group was to develop a definition which more accurately accounted for what they believed were the distinguishing features of giftedness. This definition became known as the Columbus Group definition and states that giftedness is a synchronous development in which advanced cognitive abilities and heightened intensity combine to create inner experiences and awareness that are qualitatively different from the norm. This asynchrony increases with higher intellectual capacity. The uniqueness of the gifted renders them particularly vulnerable and requires modifications in parenting, teaching and counselling in order for them to develop optimally. This definition drew on several sources, but its defining feature is the identification of asynchrony and intensities as key characteristics of gifted children. Gifted education in Ireland is poorly developed. The first official mention of gifted education was in the report of the Special Education Review Committee in 1993. This report recommended the use of the term exceptionally able to denote children with an IQ of 130 or higher. The report recognised the limitations of a precise cut-off point and defined pupils who are exceptionally able or talented as those who have demonstrated their capacity to achieve high performance in general intellectual ability, specific academic aptitude, creative or productive thinking, leadership ability, visual and performing arts, mechanical aptitude and or psychomotor ability. This definition is similar to the Marland definition in Ireland, the Education Act of 1998 offered the first legislative recognition of giftedness. It defined special educational needs as meaning the educational needs of students who have a disability and the educational needs of exceptionally able students. In 2007, the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment published a set of guidelines for teachers of exceptionally able students. These guidelines defined exceptionally able students as students who require opportunities for enrichment and extension that go beyond those provided for the general cohort of students. It should be noted that good practice for exceptionally able students is also good practice for all students and can improve the quality of teaching and learning throughout the school. There's a number of interesting features to this definition. The first is that it uses the term exceptionally able rather than gifted and thereby avoids the negative connotations that travel along with the word gifted. 
Secondly, the NCCA definition recognizes the need for enrichment and extension for gifted students. However, it completely ignores acceleration as an approach to educational provision for gifted students. Thirdly, the NCCA definition is unusual because it includes within it a statement that good practice for exceptionally able students is also good practice for all students. While this is true, it can be interpreted as meaning support for gifted provision within mixed ability environments, regardless of the efficacy of such a provision. The guidelines recognize ability and attainment in general intellectual ability or talent, specific academic aptitude or talent, visual and performing arts and sports, leadership ability, creative and productive thinking, mechanical ingenuity, and special abilities in empathy, understanding and negotiation. This view of giftedness is much broader and is more likely to identify gifted children who might otherwise be missed by conventional assessments of abilities such as tests. On the downside, the guidelines assert that 5-10% to of the cohort in any school is likely to be gifted. This is at odds with the IQ levels the guidelines suggest represent gifted. Given the heterogeneity of gifted children, there is no one definition which is sufficiently adequate in all instances to describe giftedness. For me, an adequate definition is one that captures the intellectual curiosity, drive and ability of gifted children, and which also captures the personality characteristics of these children. Because of this, I favour the Columbus Group definition over others. In a school context, it is not sufficient that a child is gifted and that they need do no more than be gifted. The scarcity of resources and the competing needs in a school environment require teachers to justify continued school intervention so that a gifted child must be able to produce at a level that justifies the resource he or she receives. Tracy Cross and Lawrence Coleman write about a school-based conception of giftedness, where a gifted child meets the identification criteria, but also performs at a level necessary to justify continued resource input. I think it is important to recognise this. However, it is also important to recognise that there are circumstances under which a gifted child will not perform at a level commensurate with ability. Because of this, there are difficulties in admitting a child to services, only to be denied those services at another point in time. In the absence of specific resources, such as in Ireland, I believe it is important that teachers are trained to adapt their teaching to take account of the presence of gifted children in a mixed ability environment. This is not an ideal situation. A mix of approaches to school organisation would be much more appropriate. But in the absence of dedicated resources, the gifted child in an Irish classroom is dependent on the motivation and commitment of teachers to receive appropriate educational challenges. In the next video, we will look at different approaches to the identification of gifted children.